Welcome to PostBurnout.com interviews. My name is Aaron Kavanagh and I'm the website's founder and editor-in-chief. PostBurnout.com is a culture website dedicated to venerating burnt-out artists the world over. Our interviews are mainly recorded to be transcribed, but every now and again we release the audio in a series we call PostBurnout.com interviews. If you enjoy what we do, be sure to subscribe. In this edition of PostBurnout.com interviews, we speak with the Toronto-based pagan punk Nisa. She talks about her recently released EP, her upcoming album Shake Me When I'm Foolish, coming to Ireland for the first time, her upcoming gigs, incorporating paganism with rock and roll, her punk foundation, the Toronto music scene, her personal philosophy, and more. I also want to note that during this recording, I was at the tail end of a pretty bad flu, so um, I was a bit delirious and a bit... Uh, I don't know. I sound a bit sick during this one. That's why. Hi, how are you? Hi, Lisa, how are you? I'm good. Yourself? I'm good, thanks. Perfect. Um, oh. Yeah. Good Sorry? Good morning. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the first thing I, I wanted to ask quite simply is like, um, just to begin, kind of like, how did you kind of uh, get into music yourself? What was kind of your uh, your own background, I guess? Well, I was in choir in elementary school, but I don't know if that quite sparked the like excitement. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was uh, kind of more happened when I was, I'd say probably around 12 or 13 and all the, all the, the bands were coming out. Like yeah. the yeah, 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 and the strokes and the white stripes and the libertines and that hit me at a ripe, romantic young age. And uh, I adored those bands. And it just never really occurred to me to only listen. I heard them and wanted to do that. I wanted to do that too. And I saw the Yeah Yeahs when I was 13. Um, and, you know, Karen O spat water all over me. <laughs> and. Uh, I uh, just wanted, I wanted to do that too. I think that's kind of cool because you're from uh, Toronto, right? So like, um, do you find Toronto to be kind of a city that's very accommodating for like all ages shows? Do you think kind of like uh, younger fans can go see shows if they like? Or, or um, I think in Canada, actually, like a lot of venues tend to be over 19, which is like, <laughs> it's very like unique. I think age restriction, like uh, is either 18 or 21 yeah. normally. <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, yeah, it feels like a weird kind of concession, but not quite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we're that great for all ages shows. I mean, yeah, certainly bigger bands, those, those shows are all ages, but we've also lost a lot of venues because of, you know, s- skewed priorities, I think, on right. the city's part to not invest in live music venues and keep them alive um so i think that's one side that's one side of things um and then uh yeah i think the other side is that it's it's a lot of bars so it's they're really relying on alcohol sales so there's not too much all ages and there's so many noise restrictions and angry neighbors so (laughs) i think it's uh, not not quite as much diy as i would as i would like yeah, that's the interesting thing too, actually, about Dublin. A lot of our venues tend to be kind of like adjacent to like suburbs for some reason. <laughs> Weird choice. <laughs> you know, I always think I'm like, you moved to the city, and part of the reason you moved to this city is probably because it had a vibrant arts and music scene, and then you want it to quiet yeah. down. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of. It is kind of... <laughs> So um, you mentioned there when you're like about 12, you started kind of getting into uh, sort of the, I guess, the kind of indie um, kind of like rock scene at the time. Um, for yourself, like I, I know then you started like participating in the in the kind of like local punk scene around that time. I was wondering what kind of steered you towards the kind of punk. I mean, obviously, like a lot of the uh, a lot of bands you were kind of mentioning have kind of like punk and post-punk kind of influence, too. So it's not like, you know, I don't know, the, the biggest stretch. <laughs> No, definitely not. Uh, I think punk, punk appealed to me. I had, I had friends who were kind of more nestled into the hardcore scene, but I, I, it always kind of like set me on edge to be, to, to be that level of hardcore. Sure. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I really, I 
gravitated to the like 70s punk from a very young age um yeah i i i don't know i really think uh despite being kind of a awkward nerdy kid i really never have liked rules you know <laughs> uh even yeah uh when it came to i would always be off doing my own weird thing instead of playing sports because just couldn't handle the rules so <laughs> okay Punk always appealed to me for for the for the breaking and the yeah and for the just sort of shattering things open and asking for something new and I think that's that's something I always value from music whether it sounds like punk or not but this I don't I don't like the way things are and I want to change them attitude. Yeah, I think that's kind of like cool because like um, obviously, I mean, you describe your music as pagan punk, and what I think is cool about that description is that it, it seems to be kind of breaking the formalities of two different genres in a way because you know you kind of look at like how punk rock uh, when it kind of started in the seventies. I mean, obviously, it wasn't there, but like you kind of look at what the the promise of uh, the kind of the the music could bring, and then throughout like the eighties and like onwards, it kind of became very uniform with what punk was like in terms of fashion, in terms of the music itself. I mean, you had a couple of variants, you had, you know, obviously the 77 kind of punk and then you had hardcore punk, but then, you know, everyone else kind of either evolved into kind of like post-punk or new wave or kind of started doing different things. Um, but yeah, punk itself got very, I think, uniform. And then uh, same also, I think with like, you know, when you hear the term pagan in terms of in, in, in the context of music, you tend to hear think of I think very like uh, earthy kind of uh, mythical almost sort of music but yeah it seems like um you know with that description you're kind of breaking the and um, the formalities about those genres yeah uh, would you agree yeah I like I like the way you put it uh yeah it's like when, when you put them together like that it becomes yeah bridges something bridges the way to something new uh I would yeah, I mean, I think I have a, I have a lot of uh, like kind of theories around music and uh, paganism and spiritual the cross section of spirituality, and I have, you know, I have uh, I'm kind of working on this theory that like every every singer in every band sort of serves a different uh, a god, so to speak, or a different divine energy, and I think, you know, the that we all we all need we all need these like archetypal forces in our life and um i think yeah the moment that you sort of calcify and or a genre calcifies or anything becomes locked into its definition it's kind of when it loses its it loses its magic and it loses its ability to connect to this uh archetypal force and i'd say you know punk feels like it's this very sort of necessary destroyer aspect that is being channeled or called upon and yeah and when the genre becomes too too locked in it kind of forget it forgets that um so i think in bridging these two things pagan punk it's uh it's almost this like inviting a bit of the wilderness back in so that new new possibilities can come about and new new connections and new forms of channeling yeah and actually what i think is this is a huge stretch i'm just going out on a limb here but uh you know if you kind of think of like the kind of polytheistic kind of aspect of paganism you know in a way it seems like it's a uh, very um inviting of how do I put this? It's very inviting of uh, of the incorporation of different entities, let's say, and the way uh, it seems like, you know, with the experimentation, the genre that you do, it's kind of like, I don't know, it seems like a kind of spiritual successor to that in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, the way I've been thinking about it and working on it, um, yeah, this idea of sort of different singers serve different gods. I've been thinking about that in relation to myself and uh really kind of yeah kind of breaking down what it is that I'm drawn to as a songwriter and a, as a performer and sort of almost qualifying qualifying myself you know I'm mm -hmm. like drawn to dark darker things and I think yeah I've been working with this like crone aspect of the goddess as of late mentioning polytheism and yeah. uh 
yeah, I performed a, a ritual with friends last night and led a guided meditation to to meet to meet the crone and uh, lay lay some of the burden of existing down. Perfect. <laughs> um, so then, when um, when it kind of came then um, to I guess incorporating kind of like um, um, the pagan um, the the pagan ethos, I guess, to your music then. So when did you kind of start? Um, I guess when did you kind of start first of all be uh, becoming a musician yourself, getting active in, in music and songwriting, and then when did the kind of incorporation of paganism kind of come into it? I played my first show when I was fourteen um, at this venue in Toronto neighborhood called Kensington Market, and so I started writing songs really young. Still got my first book of lyrics, which is really mortifying but really funny and fun mm -hmm. to look at yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and i've been uh, there <laughs> yeah it's 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 good to be able to track your progress oh, yeah. let's say <laughs> yeah uh and yeah i feel like i've always kind of had this witchy in or pagan influence on the music but um and it's yeah it's been a through line but I would say during the pandemic is kind of when it became more conscious and I started to really weave it into the stories I wanted to tell instead of it having it be sort of the symbolic texture, mm -hmm. uh, having it be more of a kind of philosophical foundation because I really found my way like hardcore back into witchcraft and paganism during the pandemic and it became really my like coping mechanism to just organize my my mind yeah and then actually when did the uh, the nissa project as it exists right now kind of like begin then because uh, as far as i'm aware the first release was uh, 2017 but when the actual project kind of like start i would say when did i start it yeah, I, I was making music with my previous band, Modern Superstitions, for uh, for a while. And then I we we disbanded and I started making music under Nisa, which is my which is my name. Yeah. Uh, when I was I think I'd say maybe like eight years ago. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. And then I started to teach myself production um, on Ableton and just kind of di yeah dived into dived into that how do you think so, the yeah. sorry <laughs> how do you think <laughs> um uh the kind of like uh getting into the production side of things kind of free your art because this is something i'm very interested in it's kind of like the idea of production as being uh an, an extension of the kind of uh creative art rather than it sort of being you know i think like before it was like people kind of divorced the two it was like you know there's the art and then there's the technical side but in, in a lot of ways i think the two are actually kind of more close together than people kind of uh, give them credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, I think there's, I mean, I think it's like wonderful to collaborate and get other people's unique character in the mix, but it's also, there's something to be said to, for, to be able to make a song on your own. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and I think it's really, I think it does really open the door for a lot of people, the accessibility of that. And especially you think, I think the accessibility of that has really led to a lot of, uh, a lot of doors being opened, especially for, for women and uh, just non, non-male, non-male mm -hmm. producers, uh, because it's just, it, it, it fosters this almost like garage band not literally garage band yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah just this ability to just sit down and like bang out a song so, yeah i think it's like <laughs> i think it's really cool like how um you get people who are like very sophisticated in, in like production then you get people who are just kind of like stringing it together with like you know chewing gum but like it all kind of works together you know what i mean like it's, as long as it works it kind of works and i think like the formalities again of kind of uh traditional music making a lot of ways in, in their kind of modern era i think are breaking down i think it is making in my opinion this is just me sort of editorializing but uh i think it's making art a lot more interesting and it's making uh kind of different voice like you can hear different voices that you kind of couldn't 
otherwise have the opportunity to. And I think also like with um the ability to just like put something online and just have the whole like be available for the whole world is like really uh cool to have too, you know? Yeah, I think that there's something to be said for the immediacy of it all. And uh I I would say I just to go on a slight tangent, I would say Absolutely. I describe myself as a very optimistic person, but within the context of sort of having this belief that everything seems like it is going to fall apart. Yeah. I think everything's going to be okay, but I also think it's all going to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do think you're seeing everything kind of, especially right now, you're seeing everything dissolve and break down at the same time. Uh, and I think, it's really, it's really scary. And as a, you know, as a musician to, to be within this industry and not know where it's, where it's going next. Cause it feels very much like everything feels very liminal. Um, but I think that wherever we're headed and wherever we're going next, having everyone kind of being able to, everyone being able to create on, their own without necessarily being being beholden. I think that's a positive thing, but I also think that we're headed into the need, everyone having the need to be more collaborative and to be working together and to be fostering community because I think I think things are I think things are really difficult and I think they're probably going to get more difficult. And I think having all these sort of solitary artists and creators band together and form communities that are not just online is going mm -hmm. to be really really important moving forward yeah because that kind of entropy you're kind of talking about like where it's like i know the kind of unforeseen just randomness of, of life itself i mean like you know obviously something like covid like that impacted everyone working in like the music industry to whatever capacity they were working in or really any industry it's like it's hard to think of any industry that wasn't impacted i guess but um mm -hmm. you know like you look at something like that and it's like okay I think that is part of the, I think COVID, like, you know, just from the perspective of, um, uh, of kind of like what came from it, like in terms of, of music and art, like a lot of bands disbanded, but then there's a lot of projects that just started that wouldn't have started, um, you know, because of that. And so it's, it's very like give and take. It's, it's very like, I don't know it's, it's hard to be like 100% pessimistic and 100% optimistic. I think there was like a lot of like, there's a lot of gray in the mix. Yes. Always always so much gray so much yeah. in between and i think that's really where the for me that's where the paganism comes in because you know for for thousands upon thousands of years we had these ways of giving meaning to difficult lives via living in tune with the the seasons and the cycles and having these rituals and ceremonies that we would perform at various times of the year and at various points in our lives and I feel that when we lose that organizing principle, it all becomes too much to bear. And so I think you can really sense that a lot of people are really craving something along those lines of communal ritual and ceremony and spirituality in order to not just fall into the chaos. Yeah, and, and actually- Sorry. <laughs> um, and maybe birth something new from chaos because there's always some chaos always leads to birth. Yeah. No, and that, that's a really like great perspective. And um, one thing I was wondering then, I mean, from like your perspective, I mean, obviously um, in a kind of micro, in a micro way, like, you know, your band has expanded from a, a solo project into a full band now. Um, I was wondering like, how do you feel that kind of differs from you as a creative person then to be kind of like, you know, having kind of full, I guess, control over every aspect to actually kind of collaborate in now. How do you feel the music changed and the project itself has changed? Well, I mean, yeah, it's uh, having, I think that was the move towards have wanting to be a part of a band um, definitely arose from the isolation of lockdown, but also my self-imposed isolation of being an only child and it, it's very natural and easy for me to function on my own but I uh, I didn't want it to be that easy anymore and it was not it wasn't feeling as easy anymore certainly 
after the many lockdowns and we we got locked down a lot here <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh and so coming out of that and you know sort of and it felt like i hadn't seen anyone in so long and it became so vital and necessary to be making music in a room with other people and to feel that connection and that energy and it's definitely something you know i i like performing on my own i like working on my backtracks i i love all of that um and i like writing songs on my own on guitar but there is nothing that really compares to when you're performing as like a six piece band and you're able to feed off the energy of everyone on stage and off of the crowd and you know you just have so many more pieces and per, per personalities that are feeding this energetic mix yeah um, and then also i mean like recently i think uh, only last week in fact you released uh, an, e an ep featuring uh, blessed touch no more bodies werewolf and a uh, breakup party um i was wondering also because you have a, an album coming out in in february i mean is this indicative do you think of of a new sound that's um that's arising or or do you feel it uh, or do you um do you find it to be just kind of like um an extension of what's already been created so far mm, so yeah so those are all all four of those are singles that are going to be on the album I think it's called like a waterfall something <laughs> a waterfall single. I, I'm not sure of the term, but I know it involves waterfall and uh, it's that stuck in my mind. Anything aquatic sticks in my mind. <laughs> uh, but yes, absolutely. It's indicative of the sound of the album. Um, Shake me where I'm foolish. Uh, it's so I think it's a very like raw and emotional album, but I also think it is an invitation to party and occupy space and uh, be kind of any, like be in each other's hair in a way. And I, I personally have a lot of belief in rock and roll. Um, it's the genre that I love most and i think you know speaking the way we spoke about punk you know these genres can kind of become empty when they get yeah when they when they become like hardened yeah but uh i think that you know rock and roll was kind of the first the way it came upon the scene with sort of the like advent of teenagers and um and you know moving into the 60s and the 70s and the possibilities and this sort of rebellious like dionysian moving back into the polytheism yeah uh, just like breaking open this straight laced puritanical uh confines of societal norms and i do think it can still i do think it still has the power to do that and uh, nothing quite compares to being in a room where powerful primal rock and roll is being played. I think it has this, yeah, it's, I think it is a very pagan experience. One thing I, I wonder, cause like, um, you know, when you kind of think of like uh, rock and roll in like the fifties context of like, you know, uh, um, kind of coming up against the kind of like white well, pick offense suburbia kind of image of like the very straight laced family and kind of like you know, um, the kind of nuclear family sort of uh, image and and I don't know like father knows best kind of attitude and then like um <clears throat> like now it seems like um you know through like uh, decades of like uh, commercialization and kind of um commodification of, of that scene and uh, you know to the point where it's like I don't know they use like bad to the bone on like commercials or whatever you know yeah. um do you find that like um i need that spirit gets diluted over the the decades or do you find that it's just about um kind of adapting it to kind of keep it raw and fresh and to keep it interesting i guess my point uh, i guess the question i'm trying to ask is like um you know like wh what do you think it is about rock and roll that's like kind of worth preserving i think you know, I think it's really important to trace and track the lineage of rock and roll to, you know, the experience of 
black Americans in the early half of the 20th century. And that is, that is where it was birthed and that is where it came from. And it incorporates, you know, that early rock and roll incorporates so many pieces. It incorporates, um, yeah, I mean, the, the blues and then the, the big band era and then country, but also indigenous music, you know, with Link Ray and uh, beyond that. Um, and that sort of the breeding ground of America in the first half of the 20th century and how hard the, the lives were that it kind of built and inspired this music. Um, and then I think, you know, when you have, when you have these kind of, I guess, like a nerdy, desperate, poor, uh, flamboyant uh, white boys who, <laughs> who are drawn to this music, yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very much, I want to trace that lineage, but then you have this, uh, it just, it sort of all just takes off at once and it becomes this, it just becomes the music of the lost and the disenfranchised and the outcast and the disgruntled. And, you know, when you get to the Beatles and the Stones, it's like post-war Britain and there's rubble in the streets and, it's just, this is the music that the youth attach themselves to in order to express themselves at that time. And that I think is something very much worth keeping alive is this genre of music as a means of expression of very vital angst. Perfect. Um, I, I just have a few last questions. You've been very uh, gracious with your time. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to plug your two shows coming up. You're coming to uh, Ireland for the first time, I believe, right? So you're doing uh, Ruby Sessions 21st of November, Wheel and 30th of November. Um, I believe actually um, your your mother is actually uh, directly from Ireland. So it's like, uh, uh, are you first gen generation Canadian? Is that correct in saying? Or Yes, I'm first generation. Perfect. So um, do you kind of like, are you looking forward to, uh, I guess, seeing the homeland? Have you been here before or is this just your first time as a uh, performer? I've been once before in summer 2022. Uh, I came with my mom and it was her first time back since being a kid. And yeah, we went to Belfast together and then she went home and I kind of continued on my own and uh I stayed at a thousand year old Benedictine monastery near, uh, near Limerick and yeah. uh, with some friends in Sligo. And yeah, I mean, I, I feel like for, um, for people with Irish ties, it's a very strong ancestral call. Yeah. And I, yeah, as a kid, I was, I felt it, I felt it very strongly. Um, and being drawn to the music and the the fairy tales and the mythology and just the just the image I had of it in my mind and then I came and I found it really it really strongly matched the image I'd held in my mind since I was a small child and so I'm very excited to come back and play my first shows and yeah. I want that to be a regular thing I wonder, like, because uh, like Dublin, like by comparison, is like such just like a an urban city, like anywhere else. I say it's from from there, so I can I can say that. But um, I was wondering, do you find that um, I don't know some of that kind of like I guess mythic mysticism or kind of um, I don't know kind of uh, cultural heritage or, or or aspects like that might be might be lost in that setting, or do you think uh, I don't know? Do you think there'd be something to be be found there? I guess. <laughs> Uh, I think I think there's something to be found there. I mean, last time I I I think Dublin and a lot of European cities, because they're so old, they're a lot more conscious of keeping the past alive. And obviously, you know that you you would know better than me. But you know, there's like it feels like the history and the the lineage is right there. Whereas being somewhere like Toronto, it feels often like there's almost a deliberate erasure of history. 
Yeah. And things keep getting torn down and new gray glass keeps going up. And I'm sure that, I mean, sure that's happening everywhere, but um, yeah, being somewhere like Dublin, you can still very much sense the, the years, the years on it. And I also think, the, I mean, the countryside is so close and Ireland is not, it's not a big, it's not a big <laughs> country. <laughs> I, I was even able to like take the bus and go to uh the was it the hell hellfire, hellfire yeah. Club? yeah and i like did that hike and without a car or anything so and there was like a sacred well on the way so i was definitely able to find find the mysticism <laughs> well actually that is one aspect that's kind of cool is i think like uh, from someone like yourself is, is kind of interested in, in sort of uh, the pagan history. I mean, like, I, I think like we, one thing I think our country is good at is, is doing like the preservation of, um, of kind of like the, the many different history, like from the kind of like, you know, even prehistoric uh, toys, like, you know, um, Newgrange, it's the, it's the place I'm thinking of where it's like, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it is co- kind of cool that like, you know, kind of once, christianity came into ireland we didn't just like get rid of that stuff that like you can still kind of visit to this day yeah it's it's i think that's why ireland is so unique is because somehow against all odds and against a lot of efforts on the parts of many invading invading yeah. forces <laughs> these stories and these places have been kept alive and now to the point where people are able to actually like find their way back back to it and yeah it's not it's not gone i mean the forests are the forests are gone but the the cairns and the fairy forts are very much very much still standing <laughs> um i've really enjoyed this uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up or mm. i think just about yeah just those shows and then yeah listen to the the new the new singles and i think i think that's everything yeah this has been lovely thank you very much um, and best of luck with the shows thank you so much yeah um if you're if you're around please come on out to the i will the- <laughs> yeah. Great. thanks bye thanks aaron bye thank you for listening to that episode of postbornout.com interviews we hope you enjoyed and stay tuned for more